I'm going to talk to you on the subject, the power of a pattern, the power of a pattern. How many of you, by a show of hands, have been saved over five years? Uh, you've been a Christian for over five years. You've been following Jesus over five years. Raise your hand. That's awesome. That's awesome. You look like a church. Um, and I want to also to have you raise your hand if you've had somebody that has impacted you, the model of their life, the way that they serve Jesus Christ, impacted you in a positive way, caused you to mature, caused you to be a better Christian. Wave at me if you've had somebody that's been that. Isn't that amazing? Every one of us have had somebody that we've looked to, and that is how the gospel spreads. It is not just through the gospel, but through our life witness. Jesus said, so let your light shine before men that people may see your good works and glorify your father. Uh, recently, my kids, or I should say I, got a piece of mail from a martial arts studio that had just opened in town. They were trying to drum up some business. And so they said, if you bring your kid, uh, we'll let them come for three weeks for $25. And so I told Angie, well, let's see if the kids like it, see if they enjoy it. So and they, it came with a costume and everything. They got the, the ninja outfit. And so we go to this little place. It's a jujitsu place. And so the kids are loving it. They're, they're all on the mat. They're, they're learning how to defend themselves or offend somebody, you know. <laughs> so they're, they're getting it down. And I'm sitting there talking to different people on the sidelines. And the, one of the guys I was talking to, this guy did not look like the epitome of health. You know, he, he looked like he could get out there and do some, some working out, you know. So I said, man, are, are you into this? Are you just watching somebody? He's like, oh, I'm, I'm big into it. I said, big into it. What does big into it mean? He said, I've been in this thing for 20 years. Like 20 years. You've been coming to the gym for 20 years? Like, yeah, 20 years. I've been studying. I said, you must be a black belt. He's like, no, no, no. no. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, a pink belt. Pink belt. A red belt. Something, one of those. But, but it sounded feminine. I, I was <laughs> I said, wow, wow, so you've been at this for a long time and, and you're not, not a black belt, which means he's been on the sidelines watching a whole lot uh, and hasn't really invested. He likes the atmosphere of the gym, but he hadn't learned how to fight yet, okay? Hold that thought. I go to the gym, believe it or not. I mean, whether you can see that or not, I do. I go to the gym, the biggest muscle I work out is my yapper. I just talk to everybody there, right? But there are some people that go to the gym that I've seen there for years, and they haven't changed a bit. They're trying to lose weight but have not lost a pound, but it's because they, they walk in the doors, they talk to everybody that's there, they go to the water fountain, uh, and when they do the treadmill, they just kind of walk and talk, and, and they go home and they tell their wife, I've been to the gym, right? Got it off the list. Uh, they've been there a long time, but it's not changing their life. And, you know, you can come to church and have the name Christian nominal, it's a nominal Christianity, and... You know, if, if, if somebody were, tell, were to tell you, I'm a ninja, master, jujitsu, black belt, and they go in the parking lot and somebody beats them up, you're like, no thanks. I don't want to learn whatever martial art you are doing. Or if they go to a gym for a long time and nothing happens, you're like, you can keep the gym. It, it's not for me because the lifestyle is not impressive it's not impressing people. And the only way that Christianity is really going to impact culture, really make a difference in culture, is when we begin to actually model and live what we preach. One of the worst things that I can hear or see on Facebook is when people say, if, if, if Christianity is anything like that person, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Have you seen something like that? It breaks my heart because when people look at Christians, they should see little Christs. All through the, all through the scriptures, there were men of God who modeled a belief in God and young men that would follow it. Take uh, Moses and, uh, and Joshua. Moses modeled 
godly leadership. Joshua studied it, and Joshua became who Moses was. Elijah modeled what it meant to serve God passionately. Elisha did the same. Elijah struck the water, and it parted. He was taken to heaven. Elisha came back and struck the water the same way. So you see how it moves from generation to generation. Uh, Jesus, with his disciples, he ministered to the masses, but he focused on the guys who would represent him. Peter did the same works that Jesus did. The, the Bible says that it got to a point when Peter would walk, his shadow would heal the sick. So you have a, a mentor and a disciple, and they begin to grow into the fullness of that. That's the idea of Christianity. You should be growing into a model so other people can copy. And if you've been hanging around a long time and you're still exactly the same, you're, you haven't changed at all, you're like the dude at the gym, you're like the dude at jujitsu, you have not moved into Christian leadership. And the whole purpose of Next is Now and the passion of this whole series is that you would step into Christian leadership. This is your year. Amen? So I want to give you this thought that we are to pattern our lives after men and women of example, and we are to become men and women of example. Paul said this statement, and and this is a bold statement. I want you to see it in Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. Check it out. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine. Like, check me out and do what I do. Is that a bold statement or what? Like, live like I live and learn from those who follow our example. And then again, he told the church in Corinth, in Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, and you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. What if you told your coworkers, imitate me as I imitate Christ? They would say, I'm not imitating you at all, right? But it's many times it's because we have not lived in a way that makes them want what we have. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. You've heard this scripture, and this is the really the one that I want to hang this message on. Paul tells Timothy, after he had invested a ton in Timothy, this is what he says: Don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. But be an example to all believers. I want to I highlight that word. Why don't you highlight it? Circle it, the word example. It's the Greek word tupos, and this is a really important word because when a, an emperor would want to imprint his signature on something, it would be the word Two posts. If you wanted to stamp something, it was the word two posts. Whatever was on the stamp got on the paper. And it's where we get the word type is from the word two posts. And so basically, whatever's on the stamp, good or bad, when it hits the paper, that's what's going to be there. And you, every one of you, are printing on the world every single day. You're, you're two posts. You're printing on the world. And, and Paul is saying, let your two posts be in these five areas. So before I tell you the five areas that he told him, a few years back, my secretary was getting to the point where she would wait a long time for me to sign these different documents that needed my signature. And she said, will you please let me get a stamp that has your signature on it? So I said, okay. And basically that she could just stamp my signature on a bunch of stuff. And and so I said, well, you got to call me and let me authorize it before you stamp. But she brought me the paper that I had to sign for them to copy. So she brings me the paper and I said, so when I sign this, they're going to copy it and make a stamp out of this? She said, yeah. And I did it. And and I have to admit, it was a really sloppy signature. I felt fancy. I was like, you know. Had a real fancy signature, but really it's illegible. Like you couldn't even tell who that was. So I never looked at it again. She copied it, put it on a stamp. There's a stamp floating out there with an illegible signature that's my signature. And so things that would come up, she'd call, she'd say, can I use your stamp? I said, sure. She'd stamp that signature on it. Well, I started to see these signatures and they didn't even look like anything. It just looked like a bunch of stuff. And I realized that I had created a stamp that was imperfect, and, the, and every time my name was being put on a document, it looked like that. This is the example of what Paul is saying. Let your life be an example 
to all the believers. And so here's my charge to every person that got up and came to church this morning. For everybody that's watching online or on television, my charge is this. You are being hit on the world every single day. Parents, you're being hit on your kids every day. What is the imprint that you're leaving behind? Because... I'm believing that God wants to turn every one of you into a mentor. He's wanting to turn you into a leader. So there are five categories. These are important uh, because Paul specifically named these five areas. Number one, he said, be an example in your speech. In your speech. The way we talk is one of the greatest examples of what it means to be a Christian. The things that we say and the things that we don't say. I'll tell you a funny story about my kids. So we were driving in the car recently. I was bringing them to school, and my daughter was in the backseat, my oldest daughter, and she said, Andy, and she said this sentence using a word that's kind of like bathroom talk. You wouldn't say it. uh, I wouldn't say it here. It's just kind of like, don't say it. It's one of the words that, When your kids say it's like a potty word, you're like, don't say that word, right? So instead of saying the word, she started, she used the first letter of the word. It happened to start with an F, okay? So, yeah, but not that one. It was like a a, a different one, a different F. She said, she said, Andy, something about the F word. And I went, what? What? Like, and I whipped my head around and I was like, what are you talking about? And she was like, you know, the word you said that we couldn't say. She was talking about another word that started with F that's kind of inappropriate. And uh, y'all like, what's he talking about? (laughs) She said, dad, you know, the word that you and mom say, but you say we can't say. Oh, that one. Oh, got it. I was quiet for like 60 seconds because I realized that my speech was making an impression on my kids. Your speech is making an impression on your kids. I'm not just talking about profanity. I'm not just talking about uh, inappropriate language. I'm talking about the things that you don't say and the things that you do say, the things that you don't say. So I had a, a junior high pastor when I was growing up that I noticed when I would walk into a room, if people were talking negatively about someone that wasn't present, this guy would walk out of the room. At first, I just thought it was coincidence that he just had to go somewhere. Then I started recognizing a pattern. Anytime someone's name was brought up and they were talked about in his presence, he would walk out the room. So one day I asked him about it. I said, are you intentionally leaving the room? And he said, yeah, I don't want to be a part of a slanderous and gossiping conversation. I just feel a conviction about it. And boy, that stuck out to me. What he didn't say is what stuck out to me. And I'm talking about it almost three decades later. I mean, it impressed me. Uh, But also what you do say. I also have a guy that I've looked up to a lot in my life. And specifically, one of uh, his greatest qualities is that he's an encourager. When he gets around you, and I thought it was just specific to me at first, and then I noticed it with everybody, he's, he just encourages. From the moment he opens his mouth, he starts to talk into your purpose, your destiny, that I believe in you. Uh, I see God doing great things in you. And it's just edification. It's encouragement. And I thought that, bro, this is just the greatest guy ever. He loves me a ton. But then I noticed that he did it to everybody that he was around. He just is an encourager. So in speech, what you don't say and what you do say, hey, there's three categories of what you shouldn't say. Are you ready? I'm going to give them to you real quick. Disloyal speech, which is gossip and slander. Watch that in your life. Refuse to be a gossip. Refuse to be a slanderer because you know what? It don't look good on you. It's it, it, You don't model Christianity well when you're a gossip and when you're a slander. Then there's dishonest speech, which is lying, it's deceit, it's exaggeration, it's half-truths. Then it's destructive speech, critical, tearing down. Have you ever watched, and specifically you ladies, have you ever watched a modeling show where ladies walk down the runway wearing new fashion? Have you? Okay, just to see if y'all are normal. So you walk, walk and they're walking with, with whatever fashion they have on. 
Have you ever seen somebody that you're like, I would never wear what they're modeling? I, I mean, I've seen people wear the dumbest things. Guys with camo stuff that you're just like, man, this is not even, nobody would wear this. You're modeling something nobody wants to wear. And when you wear your Christianity and you're a gossip and you're a slanderer, you're wearing something that nobody wants to wear. This is not something they want to copy. This is not something they want. But man, when your speech is pure, when it's edifying, when you avoid this stuff, you represent Christ in an amazing way and it imprints on the next generation and it imprints on the world around us and it's just a positive. The second thing that Paul tells Timothy, you have to be a model, is in the way that you live. And I put the word lifestyle. In your lifestyle, people are impressed with lifestyles that actually back up the preaching. In other words, if your neighbors know that you go to church, but when you come home, you're slamming car doors and screaming at each other at the top of your lungs, uh, you have a horrible home life, you're not courteous, then they don't want what you're selling. But when your lifestyle, your rhythms of life when they can look and see what God has done in your life, this is what makes Christianity so desirable. And it makes, it makes your life imprint on others. There was a guy that came to speak to our students years ago. His name is Ray Comfort. And he has a whole teaching on evangelism. It's a great teaching on evangelism. He taught our students on it. Afterwards, I was responsible to take him to dinner. So I bring him to dinner, and I was thinking, we're going to have a great conversation. We're going to hang out. I'm going to ask him a lot of questions. It's going to be awesome. Well, this is how our dinner went. We walked in, and he did a magic trick for the hostess that was there. It was like a little coin trick. She was all into what he was doing. Somehow he spun it into a gospel message and ended up praying with a girl. It was an incredible moment. Uh, and then I was like, okay, now we're going to go sit down at the table. No, no, no. He started walking around the restaurant, striking up conversations with people, doing tricks and getting their attention and sharing about Christ. He did this for 30 minutes. And then I'm sitting on in the table. I've already ordered appetizers, drinks, been sitting by myself. I haven't witnessed to one person. You know, I feel like a heathen. He comes and sits down. So we start talking. Well, the, wait, the waitress comes, and he starts talking to her, and she ends up crying, and he ends up praying with her, and now I'm just feeling like a total sinner, like not worthy to latch his shoelace, you know? But he lived out what he just preached. Now, I was a part of a sermon, and I was a part of a life demonstration. The sermon didn't change me at all. The life demonstration, I'll never forget because he lived what he preached. And so this is what it means to have a lifestyle that impresses others. What does your Monday through Friday look like? Are you a nominal Christian or are you a sold out radical believer that really impresses people? Your actions, your rhythms, your values, your stewardship, all of this is part of lifestyle. Then Paul tells Timothy, this third category, Timothy, I want you to stamp people in, with this category. It's the category of love. In our love, we are to stamp people and to make an impression on people. Everybody's impressed with somebody who truly has God's love in their heart and is flowing. Maybe you've been inspired by people like Mother Teresa in the slums of India who gave her life to just pouring out the love of God. Do you think that she loved bad smells and loved to be in garbage heaps and just that was where she wanted to be? Or was there something driving her, mobilizing her to pour out her life like that? I can tell you the love of God was being demonstrated in her life. And when, when us believers are consumed with the love of God and it flows through us, it's just obvious. I'll tell you, here's the tangible signs. When you truly forgive people, you refuse to hold grudges, that is an example to the world. When you're letting people go all the time, when you're giving mercy to people who don't deserve mercy, when you're generous and you don't live with a clenched fist, you know, stinginess and Christianity don't really go together. 
You don't have to be rich to be generous. You don't have to be rich to be generous. You can live with an open hand. This is love. This is the demonstration of love. Kindness is a demonstration of love. 1 Corinthians 13 says love is kind. When you're a Christian and you're not kind, you're a bad stamp. Your stamp is off. And the world is looking and saying, I don't want to have anything to do with that. So I just said, how many of you have been serving God for over five years? A lot of people lifted their hands. If you were in martial arts, you'd be close to a black belt. Okay? So by this time, the love of God should be radiating all around you. Everywhere you go, the kindness, the light, the life, the love, the generosity, the, the sacrificial nature. Do you see? We should be growing up and modeling this stuff. I think about guys that have impacted me. You may have never heard of this man, but T.L. Osborne was an evangelist to South America. God specifically graced his ministry with signs and wonders. He would have miracles like people that had no eyeballs. Their eyeballs would grow back. And I'd heard story after story of this man, but he visited when I was 13 years old. And we went to Don's Seafood. And when I grew up, I grew up with lots of traveling ministers and different people that would come through. They never cared about the kids. It was all adult talk, and the kids were kind of a second thought. For some reason, he narrowed in on me. And we talked for probably 20 minutes. And what I felt from him was a love that only could come from Jesus. And I told my friends after I had that encounter with him, I said, I don't think I've ever met somebody that's more like what I would think Jesus is like. This man felt like he was Jesus. There had been such a transformation. I felt like I was talking to Jesus. I'll never forget it because his love impacted me. John chapter 13, verse 34. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. The fourth category of stamp. Are you guys still hanging in there? We're stamping our lives. The fourth category is in our faith. Our faith should inspire people. The way that we believe. Now, really, this comes down to three categories. What you believe. This is your theology. Like, your faith can't be impressive to me if it's inaccurate. But when your faith is biblically aligned and your theology is there, this is an example. It's pure. So what you believe is important. How much you believe is important. Like, when you're up against an obstacle, do you believe that God is able and will come through for you, or do you kind of have doubt? This is the measure of your faith. Let your faith, the measure of your faith, be an example to people, and then let the length of your faith, how long can you endure? How long can your faith endure? Like, when you go through stuff, can you just keep hold, hanging on? At our first service this morning, I was in the back of the auditorium just worshiping, and I, I hugged one gentleman who lost his wife two months ago. I hugged another gentleman who lost his wife two months ago at the same time. And then I walked a few steps over and hugged another man who had lost his wife four months ago. So, And they didn't know that each other was standing there. just so happened that they were right in the same place in life. Amazing. Uh, all three of them had a smile on their face that was huge which for a man who's in his mid-60s and lost his wife, you don't normally find a smile on people's face. The reason for that smile is their faith. And when you see faith like that, that endures through stuff, that's an example. That's, I need some of that. I need to copy that. And so you need your faith to come to a place where it's inspirational to people. What you believe, how much you believe, and how long you believe. I've been impacted by different people of faith. Pastor Lester Summerall, when I was a kid, really impacted me. 
Also, in my early 20s was a guy named Buzzy Sutherland. Buzzy was, if there was a picture of redneck in the dictionary, Buzzy would be it. He was from Arkansas, and he talked with gravel in his voice, real country. Bless God, bless God, I'm going to heal you. Could hardly understand what he was saying. The man believed. He believed what was in the word. We need people of inspirational faith. And then the fifth category that he says, I want you to be an example in, is in your purity. In your purity. He said, Timothy, I need somebody who can model purity. Model purity. What is purity? It's not contaminated with the world. How easy is it to get contaminated with the world? Very easy. Your, I, I, your ideas, your philosophies, what you watch, what you listen to, it's easy to not be pure. But Paul is saying, be an example in purity. Paul also told him, if you keep yourself pure, you'll be a vessel that God can use for noble purposes. We need people who can exemplify a pure lifestyle. There's two types of purities, inner purity and outer purity. Outer purity can be faked. Inner purity cannot. Inner purity is your heart. It's your motives. It's why you do what you do. It's your humility. It's your meekness. This stuff you cannot fake. The outer purity, the Pharisees had that down. Jesus said, the outside of the cup is clean, but inside the cup is filthy. We need believers who are examples of what it means to be pure, to keep themselves from the world, to be an example. I'm always inspired by the Jewish people. Jesus was a Jew, in case you didn't know. Newsflash. Jesus was a Jew. All of the apostles were Jews. God chose that nation. He set them apart, and he said, I want you to give an example of what it means to be pure. And they would honor the Sabbath, and they would do all of the requirements that God required because they were an example of, to the world of being set apart. You know, people's purity does impact us. I have a question for you. You ready? When is the last time you added something to your conviction list instead of remove something as we always do? We're always crossing out convictions. When you were first saved, I, I, I did that, but I'm, I'm beyond that now. I don't have to do that anymore. We're constantly decreasing our conviction list. When's the last time you added something to your conviction list? Mm, that's good. <laughs> I encourage you, stop taking stuff off and add something to your conviction list. To live in a way that's distinct and different. But let me tell you this too. Please hear this. I haven't said this at the other services, but I'm just, the Holy Spirit's speaking right now. When you live as a Christian in an impure way, you pollute the voice of the Spirit in your life. You feel ashamed and guilty because sin will always make you feel like you have to hide. And you have the title Christian, but you live in an impure way and it has you confused because you're supposed to feel forgiven, but you feel ashamed. And it's because you have not changed lifestyle at all. You've changed banner, but not life. We should grow in our sanctification, in our pushing away of the world. I want to encourage you in purity. We're not saved by our works. 
But because we're saved, God does something in our life that begins to change us, or it should. So, I want you to show me all five hands, all five fingers on your hand. We got five hands here at Bethany, in case you didn't know. If you're watching, come see us sometime. We're weird. We got five hands. Okay. This is your speech. Okay. This is your lifestyle. This is your love. This is your faith. And this is your purity. These are the five categories of example. The five categories that you're to stamp the world. How you talk, how you live, how you love, how you believe, and your purity. I pray that we're passing this on. And what's the dream? The dream is that every person in Bethany becomes an example, becomes a stamp to the world. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Praise God. Amen. Would you bow your heads and just close your eyes? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word today. Lord, it just feels so good to hear truth, to hear your word. Lord, I pray that our lives would align with your word and your truth. Holy Spirit, thank you that forgiveness is in the house right now. Mercy is here. Compassion is here. Love is here. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here and you say, Jonathan, I'm spiritually dead. I don't know God. I feel so disconnected from him. And it's because you haven't submitted your life to him. But early this morning, 4.30 to be exact, the Lord spoke to me and said, there are going to be two types of people here. There are going to be people who are spiritually dry, and there's going to be people who are spiritually dead. And neither one in those categories should leave the way they came in. If you're here and you're dry, his presence is here to make you whole. But if you're here and you're dead, you must be born again. This is an invitation. If you need to know God and you don't, if you would love to surrender your heart to Christ with heads bowed and eyes closed and you want me to pray with you, I would love to. It would be my honor. Would you just lift up your hands and say, that's me, Pastor. I need to know God. I need to be right with him. I need forgiveness. I need him to do a work in my life. Would you lift it up high and let me pray? Okay, okay, okay. That's awesome. Lift it up high. Okay. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, 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 okay. Oh, oh man, that's so awesome, so awesome. Would you slip your hands down? So many in this room getting right with God. Guys, I want to lead you in a prayer. Just say this with me. Say, Jesus Christ, let heaven hear me. I'm a believer. I believe that you're the son of God. And I submit, I surrender my life, my will to you. Save me, Jesus. Save me from my past. Save me from sin. And I receive your love, your forgiveness, your grace. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Come on, let's celebrate with those who just gave their hearts to God.